Job, the 14th chapter. Boy, if you just got born again and got involved in the Bible, you, it would be Job, wouldn't it? It was to me. It wasn't no Job to it. This is a job. It's America. Amen. But in Israel, I guess it's Job. Job, the 14th chapter. Give you a little time to find it. Have you ever been perhaps changing or something like that and somebody walked in on you? Don't answer. Don't lift your hand. Please don't. You were trying to change and suddenly the door opened. You were embarrassed and they were embarrassed. And you were not ready, but the door popped open anyway. You know, I, I never know who's in my house. And oftentimes we don't, we don't lock all the doors and you just never know what's fixing to come through the door. And you, those moments can take place. You know, the timing was off. The result was humiliation. To me, this is life. Many times we get caught off guard. And the story of Job is familiar to many of us. And here's a man to whom the Bible says he was upright, but his righteousness did not exempt him from trouble. I mean, he was somebody who had it going on. But even though he was right, he still got himself in, uh, he, he still had trouble. He lost everything he had, but he would not curse God he would not deny God and, and maybe the little secret sauce to all that is found in verse 13 of chapter 14 where he says if only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger has passed Job misunderstood what was going on in his life and he thought the balls on his skin the death of his family the death of his uh, servants the loss of his goats his camels his cows uh the fact that God took everything and left his wife. Uh, there's a joke in there somewhere if you look for it. Uh, that evidently God was mad at him. He looked at it that God was angry. So he says, uh, if only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger is past. If only you would set me a time and then remember me. In other words, put me aside like a whatnot and then bring me out back out later and use me. That's how Job was thinking. And I think we've all thought that at times. And then he said, if a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. Let me tell you real quick about Job. Job is a contemporary with Abraham, which means he lived at the same time as Abraham, which would make Job is, uh, one of the oldest books in the Bible, which makes this a tremendous revelation for a man to ask the question, will a man live again? If he die, will he come alive again? Uh, you have to look in the scripture and see how somebody poses that question. This is a great question. King James says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. I'm going to wait all the days of my appointed time. So Job had also an understanding of time. Uh, appointed time, all the days of those. Appointed time, the uh, Hebrew language means to mark by a limit, to determine, ordain, uh, of divinely appointed seasons when I, I i teach and preach a lot of funerals i have one tomorrow and in a lot of times i will talk about appointed times because people get angry but you don't realize we have an appointed time to die we have an appointed time to be here it, it's set by a limit there, here's the other limit the lim a limit for a lot of us is our bodies wearing out or the earth suit that we're in it begins to deteriorate and we realize that there's only so much time left time is located in the parentheses of eternity if you, you you can't hardly see eternity but if you look at my hands and you think of these as parentheses on both sides is eternity god lived on this side of eternity and there was no time there then he developed time for us and he lives on this side of eternity that makes us what is known as parenthetical people which simply meant i said that word today parentheticals and somebody looked at me and said pastor that's a big word for you i said yeah i know them i just don't always use them because i'm trying to help you out all right parenthetical simply means that that we live within these parentheses but when we get when we leave this earth we're no longer in these parentheses we're, we're we're gone from this time amen the plan was set before time began time is the place that god sets apart to accomplish his plan uh we all have a birth certificate, and one day we'll have a death certificate. Job says, and he, he realized, he said, I realize I have an appointment, and it is called my time. There is something that must be accomplished, and I have a part in it. There are different appointments for everything that we do in life. Ecclesiastes 3 says, to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born. And there's a time to die. 
There's a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get, a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend or tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Your greatest... uh, what are your greatest gifts can be in everybody's life, and I think everybody needs this, is to know what time it is. Do you know? I don't know what time it is in your life, but in everybody here, I just gave you a whole list of things that we do. Now, let me uh, clear some, something up. When the Bible says thou shalt not kill, it actually says in the, in the uh, Hebrew language thou shalt not murder, premeditated murder, because some people look at that and say you can't kill, but we understand there's a time for war. During war, there are people being killed. So when you look at this, it's translated over into English. It comes across kill, but it really means murder. Thou shalt not murder. You still not to murder. But in war, you know that there are people that are dying on both sides. So there are set times. Everybody say set times. My times, I love this verse. It means so much to me in Psalm 31, verse 15. My times are in your hands. My times are in your hands. And, and I like the fact that it says hands, not hand, but hands, which means God has two hands. God's not schizophrenic. But God is ambidextrous. He can use both hands. When you study Job, Job is the only place in the Word of God where it speaks of the left hand of God. The left hand of God where he doth hide. There's a side of God that hides that, that in other words, w- when he's working mildly on the right hand, you can't see it because he's got you hit on the, on the left side. There are times things take place in life that we don't understand. It has something to do with the left hand of God. Uh, it, it's going to be revealed later. I know what he's doing with his right hand. This is power. This is ministry. This is anointing. There's so many, this is fellowship. The right hand was always used for that. But that left hand is a hidden place. And uh, God hides at times on the left hand where he doth hide. Uh, he, he hides himself from us. And, and I believe what he does when he does that, he forces us to seek after him, to go after him. The Message Bible says in Acts 1, 6, when they were together for the last time, they asked, Master, are you going to restore the kingdom of, to Israel now? He said, is this the time? He told them, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. That's powerful. It's his business when we are born. It's his business when we die. It's going to be his business when we go. This is important to understand. Timing has everything to do with God. So I, I being parenthetical, being in this place in my life, as I'm getting older, I'm saying, okay, God, I know that eventually this time of mine is going to run out. Help me do everything I need to do before that time runs out. Let me, and, and, and how many know that a couple of months ago I had a bike wreck and, and God let me up and I thought to myself, uh, I would like to know just if you'd give me a heads up. I'm still praying for that heads up. Just give me the heads up before I go. You know, just, and I'm not saying he will, but that'd be nice if I got one because then I could yell one more time, forgive me. Because probably wherever I'm at at that moment, I'm probably going to be in trouble. Times, times, times in Hebrew language. My now, my then, my when, my after, my always, my evening. My due season are in his hands. Again, my now, my then, my when, my after, my always, my evening, my due season are in his hands. His hand, the open one, indicating power, means direction also. That, that my times are in his hands, but it also means that God gives me direction at the right time. Marley, that's what happened to you. God gave you direction at the right time. Timing's important in our life. If we miss timing, if you know anything about vehicles, if they ever get out of timing, a little bit out of time, and they sputter, but it'll keep running. But it's not running good. If it gets way out of time, I remember my dad going out with a timing light and then shooting it down inside the engine and watching to see that light, get everything lined up, moving that distributor. And I, you know, we don't do that stuff hardly anymore, but I, you would watch him do that because you had to do your own mechanical work, you know. So he's out there to make sure, and you'd hear that car, that car would start tuning down and everything would get right. See, I, I meet a lot of folk. I think a lot of folk when they first come to church, particularly, they out of time. The timing's off. They, they sputter in. Amen. And if we preach good and, we, and, and the word's good and the fellowship's good and the worship's good, then all of a sudden it's like the time and light hits and everything starts getting back right. And they might not leave perfectly on time, but they sound a little better leaving when at the back door than they did when they came in. Yeah. Amen. We start getting our timing back down a little bit. If my time is appointed by him and is powered by him 
and the means for that time is supplied by him, which means he gives me provision, then that time cannot end until he says so. And this is important. He inserts me into his time, giving me my time. When you fell out of that tree, H, it was not your time to die. Uh, and God made sure your wife was near because she's the only one that I know in this world that will kiss you and resuscitate <laughs> them lips of yours to make you come back alive. So God set that up so that when you went down, everything was right, and I'd come to the hospital and meet, and we would reconnect like this. So it's timing. Everybody say timing. It's, it's, it's always right on. You know, whatever my time is, it's in his hand. Say that with me. Whatever my time is, it's in his hand. Notice that Job, Job said again, If only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger is past. If only you would set me a time and then remember me. <laughs> you know, the issue is sometimes I, want to, I, I don't want God to see me. I don't want him to know. I don't want him to know what goes on in my heart and my head and things of that nature at times. But I don't want him to forget me either. Right? I mean, it's kind of like my children at times. are kind of like when I was a child. There were times I didn't want my mom and dad to know. But I sure didn't want to, you know, be uh, uh, disinherited or, or removed from the family. I still wanted to have that connection. I, I, I said something to the kids. I, I met with all the teenagers, and one of the questions was posed to me about uh, what is one, And I forgot exactly how the question was, but I do remember my answer. I said, quit worrying about being a hypocrite. Because this is what bothers me. We're so imperfect, and we, we hear a perfect word, and we read a perfect word, and we understand that God is perfect. And, and, but we get into a place in our life where we beat ourselves up over the littlest things. And if you can learn to live life, and you know, and I read the scripture, let the weak say I'm strong, and the poor say I'm rich. And I'm reading that, and I'm realizing, you know, the Bible's telling me to kind of you know, call myself up out of something here. But the truth is, there's times I was poor, and it's hard for me to say I was rich when I was poor. And so it's, it's, you look at that, and so don't beat yourself up all the time. Job's kind of beating himself up. He's, he pulled himself back some, and, and, and when, he did that, when he does this, he, he's saying to God, if only you would hide me in the grave. I, I can tell you, there are times I, all, uh, I wish I was dead. There are probably times some of y'all wish. It, it was amazing during that altar call how many kids come up and said they, they had thoughts of suicide. It was amazing. Kids, your kids thinking that way. And you say, how, well, how does that get that way? It, it, the pressure today is so much greater because of social media, the, the, the desire to be compared to, to look, to have the standard of, of a perfection, drive the right thing, everybody driving big four-wheel drives, they're looking good in cars and pretty and stuff like that. And other kids look at that and go, I can't do that. I can't measure up. I might as well die. And they get that in their head, and some do. So it's important to, when you read what Job is saying here and remind people, you've got a certain amount of time here. You need to live that time. If only you would hide me in the grave until your anger is past. If only you would set me a time and didn't remember me. Job prayed for a set time. He wanted that time. All mature believers know that there are set times. This is a time that God has established to come to pass. He's fixing, I, I believe he's fixing to display us. He's fixing to bring us out from hiding. Amen. He's fixing to show the church off just a little bit. Hope you're ready. Psalm 102 verse 11 says, My days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, sit enthroned forever. Why? Because he sits outside the parentheses. He's there forever. Your renown endures through all generations. You will arise and have compassion on Zion, the church. For it is time to show favor to her. The appointed time has come. I believe the church is going to rise. I really do. I don't think we're going to whimper out. I don't think we're going to, it's just the end of us. I think God's fixing to show us off. There's that moment where you've worked on it, you've remodeled it, you, you, you've put new bumpers on it, you painted it yellow, you got that thing all pretty, then comes that, this, that moment of display and you're so proud. That's how God's done with us, man. He's going to do the same thing. He's working on us and working on us, and one day he's going to show us off. Can I get an amen? amen? I tell you, you better be ready. Paul's time. Everybody say Paul's time. Love it, love it, love it. Greatest invention in the world on a DVR is the pause button. I can hit that button and let my wife go ahead and tell me anything she wants to say. She just talked, and I'm just sitting right there thinking, I ain't lost nothing. <laughs> ain't nothing like having just that. Oh, I'm sorry, ladies. I'm sure y'all hit the pause button too. Never, never mind. Not as much as he does, I know. But waiting time, just that waiting time. Job 14, 14, he said, I will wait. This season represents the metamorphosis of time. Uh, there is nothing pretty about a 
but it represents that stage between a caterpillar and a butterfly. It's nature's example for us. The time spent in the cocoon varies according to the season of the year and the kind of butterfly being formed. Just before the butterfly comes forth, it appears to be dead. It looks like there's nothing there. It's brown. It's wilted. Little boy finds a butterfly struggling to appear and helped it out only to see it fly off and die. He asked the teacher, what happened? And the teacher replied, catch this, guys, real good. You've heard it before, but hear it again. You removed it from the thing that would teach it how to survive. You removed it from the thing that would teach it how to survive. We as parents are good at trying to help our children not struggle. We try to take the struggle of life away from them. We try to make everything easy for them. If we are not careful, we will take the very thing away from them that's going to help them survive. I listen to your testimonies. They sound like mine. You struggled. You walked through things. You, you, had, uh, you didn't have the best upbringing. There were things that took place. You, some of you may have had uh, not the resources when you were young, not the food that you had. I, I sent uh, a friend of mine a, a picture today of the Mac sandwich. I don't know if you've seen the Mac sandwich. It's not a Big Mac. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's bologna between three pieces of bread. Amen. That was smart, man. You know, when you ain't got the money, you use bologna. Some of you bless your heart. Some of our kids ain't never had a spam sandwich or a bologna sandwich. I ate a mayonnaise sandwich when I was a kid. Then I put lettuce on it and had a lettuce sandwich. Then the tomatoes would come in. I'd have a lettuce and tomato sandwich. I can't remember ever getting to put bacon on it. It just didn't happen that way. I mean, we come up with, we invented sandwiches. My daddy would go, to, would go to work. My mama would make him a pineapple sandwich because that's what we got from commodities. She'd make him an apple sandwich. She'd chip apple up and put it. It didn't matter. As long as it had mayo and bread on it, we'd eat it. Amen. You know, we come up, the, the, I remember staring in the microwave the first time watching it. The whole fa- five of us staring into the lidded microwave, <laughs> watching that thing cook a wiener. <laughs> we were so scared that thing was going to explode because we heard if you put a poodle in there to dry it, it'd blow it up. <laughs> I don't know. If you hear that, you hear that, that means what? Somebody tried it. Yeah, so this was, this was coming up. You know, this was being this way. We went through struggles. And my prayer is, is that I have not hurt my kids so much so because I had this thought in my head, I want to make life better for them than I had it for myself. I heard my daddy say the same thing to me. I want it better for you than I had it for myself. And so I want it better for my kids than I had it for myself. And now I'm realizing there's got to come a place where that, that stops. It breaks down. You can't just keep making it better for the next generation. So we bring them up. We're not careful. We'll take the very thing away from them that's going to make them uh, mature and help them grow in life. So I say that to my own detriment because I've, I've been very good to my kids. There is such a thing as being taken out too early. This I know is true. I've done too many funerals. I've seen it happen. Uh, my aunt took her own life. Uh, she was uh, 32 years old. Uh, I, I, I know uh, we've walked through this as a church family. John 11, verse 1 says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. His, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Then he heard this. Jesus said, this sickness not, will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that the God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there for two more days. It's an amazing story. We talked some about Lazarus a couple of weeks ago. He said in, uh, in verse 4, this sickness will not end in death. He never said death would not come. He said that death would not be the end, that this sickness would not be the end of his life. The sickness would not be take him out. Many times we think something is over because it dies. But really it's not the end but the beginning. When you don't have the strength to compete, God has the power to complete. There's times in our lives when we we, we feel like we can't go on. I've been watching the Olympics like many of you, and you feel like you can't go on. This one I would tell you that God has the power to help you. It could not... It could not because his time was in God's hand. Whatever the end, God will get the glory. And that's what Jesus said here. This is for the glory of God. Then Jesus said in verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know 
I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. It's amazing how many times we say something for the benefit of the others around us. There are times I don't want to say this again and again. I don't want to pray out loud. I don't want to, but then I'll see certain people come around me, and I'll say it for the benefit of the others. I, I, I prayed and gave a word over everybody we baptized, I think, Sunday. And, and, but I, I, it, was, it was personal to them, but I wanted their family to hear me say it. I want, it was for the benefit of them to understand I, that God showed me something about this child, amen, and I want you to hear the word, amen. So when he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I walked into a restaurant today with my son Josiah, and there sat a family, uh, two families that, that I had known. And I knew that the young man who was 19 years old was in a terrible auto accident, broke his back, uh, 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 spleen, uh, bleeding on the brain. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, six, eight other bones broke, ribs broke. It was, it was a terrible accident. And there he sat. And I looked at him, and I said, son, you are a walking miracle. And all the grandma just went on about angels. She said, pastor, there had to be angels watching over him. There's no way in the world when you see the vehicle, how they pulled him out. This boy's six foot two, six three. How, how they pulled him out of that car, cause, uh, that, that expedition, because it's so crunched up. And I looked at him, and I said, you're, you're an absolute miracle. I'm trying to think. Somebody else just almost had a near-death experience and came back. Y'all think of somebody right now? Somebody else who I just knew talk with the issue is this once you've been nearly dead and you come back how, how does that change you should it change you do you have to do we have to go through that in order to appreciate the jesus in our life seriously you don't have to but when you do it h it does make you appreciate life doesn't it because you still got a little life destiny hinges on our personal breakthrough it's amazing how we're six days before passover a supper was held in jesus honor held for some of the most powerful atmospheric changing personalities. How many know some people have a personality when they walk into a place they can change the atmosphere? I'm one of those. <laughs> Good or bad, I'm going to change the atmosphere when I go into a place. It just seems to always happen. And so here he is, six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus so, so recently raised from the dead. I love how it says, so recently raised from the dead was living. Lazarus and his sisters invited Jesus to dinner at their home. Martha served. Martha always served. Lazarus was one of those sitting at the table with them. Can you imagine, again, guys, being once dead and now alive? The power of God releases you from the old ties and lies to live in peace and power. God opened your grave of failure to prove that he wants you to have abundant life. You know, there's something about Lazarus to me. Uh, how? How would you live? How would you live if you knew that, that, that just momentarily you were for a few days laying in a grave, and I don't know if his body was there, if he, under, if he saw it. I, I don't know how that translates. I know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Was he with God? Was he pulled back? But, but, to, but even for a moment, he had to come back into that body. He had to get his body back. And he's in the body, and, and it's the smell of stench all around. You're among all the other dead. And now you hear your name being called, and, and, and you know that's your name, and you can hear, and you come wiggling your way out of the, out of the ground. How would you live if God resurrects you like that? And then I remind you that we were all dead in our sins. We hung out with some of the most ghastly, ungodly people you have ever met. Some of us pulled right out of that mess, man, and we said, we're not going to live that way no more. We're going to serve God. Things started changing, language, uh, uh, where we went, all those things. Everything began to shift in us, and it wasn't that we were becoming perfect or, or pharisaical. We started loving people and caring about people and, and, and forgiving people and, and our whole lives. It was just about Jesus. Jesus became everything to us. This is what happens. When you really get born again, you get a lot of Jesus. What I find in our church today is most people's theology, their love for God is about a mile wide and about an inch deep. That's it. Anything can pull them away from it. Anything can get them away. Instead of going deep in God and growing in Him, we're wide, man. We can talk about all kind of stuff about the Bible and Scripture. I, I, I had a man, um, I did his daughter's wedding, and he showed up at church Sunday, and he's, he's a good old country boy. But when he walked outside, he shook my hand. He said, preacher, and he tried to quote a Scripture in front of me. And I just hugged him anyway because I knew that I didn't rung his bell in church. Yeah, I didn't I got him. 
I knew I had him because he said on second row, I had him. What would you do like if heaven resuscitated your lips and breathed air back into you? That's what happened when you got born again. You know, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. He came to give us life, man, and life more abundantly. Look, guys, I, I don't know how bad I'd have been had God not rescued me, but I ain't been the best of saints for 30 years. That's why I say I, you're believers who be, are being discipled to become more like Christ. I'm not giving you an out to be, to, to, to be uh, butt ugly to other people. All right? Now, see, y'all not going to hear that word a lot. But, but you, you just can't be that way to folk. You know, but so, but what I am saying is, is that we do, we, we, we're not there yet, but God loves us. What would you do? Let me tell you first what I'd do. I'd only show up for Jesus. As much as I like y'all, I'd only show up for Jesus. Amen. I'd go to church because Jesus is there. I'd go to church because when I worship, a while ago when I was sitting standing here worshiping, it was me and the band. I didn't know y'all were behind me, nor did I care. There are times you have, and that's the way you have to learn to worship. You've got to learn to worship with nobody else around you, just you and him. You're hearing the words, the music. Amen. You're, 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 you're singing the best of your ability. Amen. That's worship unto him. There's something that takes place. Only show up for him, for him. It's amazing to me how many people I've seen that have seen miracles and do miracles, and they launch a tremendous lucrative uh, sideshow ministry because somebody got healed, and everybody knows about it. Uh, sometimes I think that's hindered our healings. Because we want the glory instead of God getting it. We won't get out of the way. Lazarus, my friend, was too much in love with the solution to glamorize the problem. He didn't, you don't hear Lazarus talking about death anymore. He, he's hanging out with Jesus now. Word got out among the Jews. The Bible says he was back in town. Everybody say back in town. You know, the thing is, it wasn't just Lazarus back in town. It was Jesus and the boys. There's an old song back when I was a kid, the boys are back in town. You know, they, they're there now. They're back in town with them. The people came to take a look, not only at Jesus, watch this, but also at Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. I believe Lazarus looked at blue skies and green grass and listened to the birds chirp. I believe when he fished, he wasn't about catching the fish anymore. He was just getting a chance to go. Simple pleasures are a pleasure to a once dead man. If you come back alive, it's just the joys of being alive. It's breathing and hanging out with people and, and loving family and friends. Even the Jews knew, if you want to see Lazarus, you better find where Jesus is. Amen. If you want to find, because that's where he's going to be. Wherever Jesus is, that's where Lazarus is going to be. I'd rather be alone than to go back to the tomb of my problem. Gratitude, my friend. Let me give you three good points about gratitude. Why was Lazarus hanging out with Jesus? He was thankful. He was thankful. Why are you here tonight? Hopefully you're thankful. Why would you come back Sunday? Hopefully you're thankful. Why would you pray on a Thursday morning? Hopefully you're thankful. Well, when you serve in God, you're thankful for what he's done in your life. Gratitude creates a natural desire to support ministry. He wanted to support Jesus' ministry. When you appreciate what's gone on, I appreciate the way you support me, the way you support David and Tony, uh, uh, David and Tony and, and Joseph, the way you support the other ministries in this house. And when other ministries come in, that's important. You know, I'm going to say something to you guys. Marley was only in a meeting for three days, but she'll never forget the people prophesied over her and spent time with her. I appreciate Crystal and, and, and Mark Lamont for coming out every year for five, six years now and helping us with our children's church. They're not even part of our church, but they love us. They, mean, they just connected that way. Gratitude creates a natural desire to support ministry. Gratitude is appreciation for relationships. And I told you Sunday, gratitude confirms relationships. As long as you're thankful for somebody, it confirms relationship. That's why it's important for your children to tell you thank you. Well, but they ain't got to tell me thank you. I'm their, kid, I'm their parent. No, they need to say thank you. Our kids need to, we need to say it to one another. Thank you. There's something about when you're thankful to people. It releases something, and, and it confirms relationship when you are thankful. When somebody does something for you and you're not thankful for it, you just, you, you, it's like spitting in their face. You need to be thankful. You need to thank them. I don't care if it's a door open, a plate taken, or somebody gave you a new vehicle. Thank, be thankful. Keep gratitude alive. Amen? So this was this man. He, 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 he's confirming his relationship. Second, uh, recline in his presence. The Bible says he was there, so that, uh, John 12, 2. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving with Lazarus, was one of those climbing at the table with him. L Lazarus' resurrection thoughts weren't on the man upstairs. 
It wasn't about the big guy in the sky. Jesus had pulled him out of the muck and the mire, and he knew it. Jesus, nobody else can satisfy. Lazarus is too smart. Man, he was a smart guy. Reclining, when I hear the word recline, it's the most relaxing time of my day. I have a recliner. And it's the most wore out seat in the house. And when my backside hits that thing, I know just how much pressure to put on it to make that thing pop up. I am a professional recliner. <laughs> There's something about that relaxing moment, knowing that, uh, and, and, and look, and my shoes are off. Jill come to the house. You know, we're just moving to a and She said, Pastor, will you help me with this? Watch this. I said, nope. She stood over me, looked at me, and we said, what? I said, and I said again, I said, no, I'm reclining. <laughs> I'm, sweat was drying from my face from coming off the ropes. Of course, my shoes off. You don't see me a lot with my shoes off. I don't walk without my shoes on. My shoes off. I ain't putting them back on to get up and help you with something that somebody else around here can help you with. Next thing I know, she's calling David. <laughs> David, they come to the house. Guess what? I'm still reclining. No guilt. <laughs> no shame. I am reclining. Lazarus has come out to grave. He ain't got no guilt. Who's serving? Martha. You see Lazarus heading to the kitchen? Nope. He's sitting out there reclining. He's relaxing with Jesus. He's just hanging out with him. He's too smart to stop taking treatments. Just because his condition improved, you got to recline with the doctor. Now, I've told you this, guys. When that little, that little bottle you take with that medicine in it, it says, take till empty. I call them the gospel pill. You keep taking the gospel pill till empty. It ain't going to be empty till Jesus comes back. You've got to stay with him. You can't get a little born again or a little Holy Ghost blessing out of camp and say, well, that's all I need. Uh-uh, they I say unto thee. You stay with this thing. You've got to stay with it. Well, I don't always feel it. You're living by faith now. Amen. you waiting. I'm going to wait till my change comes. i got change coming. Amen. Change is going. I got an appointed time. This thing is going to take place in my life. Now, I wonder about Lazarus. If, if somehow he was between Twix, between Twix and Tween, you know, between here and there. Uh, I don't know how long, you know, but, but there he was. And, and, and it was like God, when he got up there, the father said to him, Lazarus, don't get comfortable. <laughs> Excuse me? Don't get comfortable. Yeah, don't sit in the recliner. <laughs> don't sit down. Lazarus. Don't, don't go behind me. <laughs> Do not look at the curtain behind me. Don't go back there. You're not going to get to stay here. Well, what are you talking about? Just, just hold on just a minute. And then from the balcony, he heard from the, from the earth, Lazarus, come forth. Oh, shoot. <laughs> he got to go right back down and get back to his body. So now all he's going to do is hang out with Jesus. Because right? he done met, met the Father, so he knows how, he knows how this, this thing's working, man. I, I ain't going nowhere else but hanging out with him. That's a good place for me, for me to be. The third thing here is, guys, learn to live beyond intimidation, man fear. It's the one thing that will shut you down. It will stop you from sharing the word, testifying, man fear. Living beyond intimidation is a powerful thing. Uh, if, Leadership is always seen in manipulation, intimidation, and inspiration. Manipulation through deceit, intimidation through fear, power, and then the third thing, inspiration by example. Jesus was always an example. Uh, when you look at the Old Testament, you see people who were leaders. They led by example, the good leaders. Saul would try to lead by manipulation and intimidation, but David led by inspiration. He was an example to the people. It's very important. John chapter 12, it says, When the large crowd of Jews realized that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Why? So the high priest planned to kill Lazarus. What? They planned to kill him. Kill him, T-double-O, two. So they added his name. You got a wanted poster with Jesus on it. Right below it, it said, and last. Kill him, too. Get him while you're at it. Since he was the reason why so many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Listen, this same mentality is among uh, Muslims and uh, Middle Eastern people today. They hate Christians. They hate you. They hate Jesus. They, they, so if you connected with him, you on the list too. So they're going to kill Lazarus. They're going after him. Survival breeds confidence. The more you survive something, the more confidence you got. 
If you just keep, if, if, if you can survive it and go through it, it's just like now you got calm. So here's here's Lazarus. That he's going to live beyond intimidation. You don't see him hiding. You don't see him getting an entourage of people to gather around him with, with guns. <laughs> he's good with it, man. Well, hey, go hold on. What? You're going to kill me? You're going to cause me to die? I've been there. Done that. <laughs> you, you, you are not going to put fear in me. I know what's on the other side. I got as far as the Father. I want to get to the other side. Go ahead. Take me out if you will. But you ain't going gonna to walk around and be scared of you the rest of my life. You've got to learn to live beyond intimidation and to know that. Let me start closing with this. Amen. Lazarus. Lazarus, there's nothing more threatening to the enemy than your testimony. When you're a tribe member with a testimony, and talk to you about this Sunday, when you got a testimony, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, ordinance, law, when you'll praise, all those things. Lazarus being in the very presence of Jesus showed he had a testimony. We are all responsible for our responses in our daily encounters with Jesus and each other. And by the way, you can't threaten a dead man. And if you realize that you are dead in your sin, the old you is gone, and whatever is left of you, and I will tell you this, we are going to change. We're going to change. Wait till your change comes. Your change may be on this earth. That's my prayer. But if God doesn't change things for you here, he's going to change things for you there. A hundred percent, all of us are going to change when we get there. So we wait, and we believe, and we hang on, amen, for that to happen. You know, people only fear what they haven't faced. Lazarus had faced death. He wasn't scared of death no more. Lazarus knew the cold terror of lying with other rotten corpses. He'd already faced that. He wasn't intimidated. You know, you can kill me if you want to take that chance, but I know Jesus. Warning, guys. And I, I, well, I, I don't have time for this much, that much. Uh, last point. Now, strengthen your brothers. If you've been raised from the dead, if God has done something great for your life, do something and strengthen your brothers. John 12, 17. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify to that, to what they had seen. This accounts for the crowd going out to meet him, for they had heard that he had performed this sign. For the Pharisees said to one another, See, you see there, there's nothing you can do. Look, the world has gone after him. It's my prayer that people start realizing they're resurrected, start strengthening one another, and watch to see the world come after Jesus again. Those who were once dead are now alive. And only Jesus has the power to change you. That's it. Only he has. Let's stand together. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. I want to change. I know many of you want to change. I think it's the fight that goes on inside of us. You know, there it always seems to be a fight for change. So he says here, I'm going to wait till my change comes. You know, I'm not quitting. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to hang out with Jesus. I'm going to recline in his presence. I'm going to live beyond intimidation. I'm going to share what God has done in my life. Lazarus didn't go hide after he got re resurrected. Neither should you. You should let folk know. Let me tell you what God's done in my life. Share with them. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, We have this treasure in earth and in jars of clay to show that it's all surpassing powers from God and not from us. Scriptures run through my head a lot. And... And lately it's been greater is he that's in us. In him we live and move and have our being. And then I look at this one and I say, hang on. All, all that power is from God. It's not from us. And it's in us. I don't, do you realize the power that's in you? That, that inside you is, is God Almighty to change us. Amen. To see us. You may not, you, 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 you may not can see it. But I'm telling you, I've seen it in people's lives. I look at them and I go, man, that's a box of dynamite right there. They ain't got no idea of the potential they got in their lives. If they could just turn that thing loose and turn it toward God, you know, you may not see it, but I'm telling you it's there. So there are set times. We all have set times. There are pause. There's waiting times in our lives. And then there are times that Jesus gives us a promise, a promise time. You stay with Jesus. Why? Till my change comes. I believe my change is coming. You believe your change is coming? I do. I really do. I've seen it too many times. There are changes taking place in some of the people I know right now that I won't utter in front of you because I don't want to embarrass them. But I've seen change. I've seen God 
shifting things in their lives. I've seen evil spirits running from them. I've seen a, a, a more appreciation. I've, seen, I've heard the word thank you more. I've seen God doing stuff. And I'm, going, I'm just kind of sitting back and going and saying, I could, I've been trying to make that happen for years. And, it, and God do it and just like that. But I had to wait. The change comes. Change means to, to pass on, to grow up, to mature. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He started it, he'll finish it. He's Alpha and Omega. He will take you from one parenthesis to the next parenthesis. Amen? And then we'll all be with him. Let's pray. Father, my prayer is for you to perform that which you have started in our lives, to complete, to finish, to accomplish. Our times are in your hands. Time is your business. My prayer as you begin to take fear out of the hearts of your people about the end of that parenthesis, that we would live our lives to the fullness and believe you for whatever time we have left. And that God, other people on earth would not be bitter because of that removal or whatever happens in our lives. We thank you that we'll all see that day. We're going to leave the land of the dying and go to the land of the living. I thank you for your goodness. Fulfill your promises in our life. Change us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen, guys. Thanks for coming tonight. You're very attentive. That's a good long teaching. Hopefully you got it. I love you. Get your kids, please.